All right, welcome to why and how to add scripting. Uh, I am Jason Turner. Um, you can find any of my presentations on my GitHub repository on the top thing, including all the source code to all the examples that are going to be in this talk. I am the co-host of CppCast, and that's a podcast for C++ developers, and the co-creator of ChaiScript, which I'm going to be mentioning some in this talk. Um, I'm on Twitter. So uh, I prefer an interactive session. Please interrupt me. Please ask questions. So is anyone in the room currently using scripting with their C++? Handful. What, uh, what tools are you guys using? What's that? Kind of. Kind of. <laughs> OK. Python and Swig, I do count that. I'll be talking about Swig, but from the Ruby perspective today. OK. Um, you're using TypeScript? <laughs> I accept that answer. <laughs> so um, I've been using scripting for a while. My first embedded scripting engine in C++ was using Lua via Swig in about 2006. Then I created this little tool called the Swig Starter Kit, which is to help people learn how to use Swig, because I didn't feel like they had a good enough like getting started story. Um, that led to me getting a job that has been doing scripting since then. Started TypeScript in 2009. Um, I've consulted on various C++ and scripting projects for the last six years. The main project that I work on is extremely large. It's exposure to Ruby Swig specifically. Uh, the count that I just ran before preparing this talk, we've got uh, 2,209 classes slash template instantiations that we're exposing to Ruby, which is a total of 67,000 methods approximately. And this tool can support Ruby, Python, JavaScript, C Sharp, Java, all using Swig. And we have to support Windows, Mac, and Linux, which is, can be annoying. <clears throat> So in general, I meet two kinds of developers, those who are already scripting and those who have absolutely no idea why one would want to use scripting in their C++ project. Does anyone fall into that category right now? I figure if you came to this talk, you probably have some idea what you might want to. So specifically today, we're going to focus on calling script from your C++, not calling C++ from your script. Uh, There's a subtle difference, but they are closely related um, problems, but the point is Today we're talking about embedding a scripting engine in your C++ application. So why would you want to add scripting? I've tried to come up with a few examples here. Any application of any real complexity is going to need some sort of runtime configuration. And often, in my experience, this ends up being a simple, easy to parse file. I worked on a project that had something similar to this, an INI file, key value pairs. Anyone seen anything like this in your projects? All right. Now, this is interesting. It works. But what you really meant to say was that widget 2 is um, relative to widget 1. We want it to be n the same x, but offset by the same width. And we want it to be at the same y location. And even if you're using something more advanced than a home uh, brood configuration file, you're still going to have this issue with JSON, XML, YAML, whatever, because there's no great way to express these kind of relationships in my experience. So what you want, something like this. Just write out a script. Say, well, I want widget 2 to be relative to widget 1. And then do whatever you need to to add these widgets into your system. Might be talking too fast. Anyone have any questions? <laughs> so by using a scripting engine, we're going to gain flexibility, and we're going to save the effort of writing our own par parser. And we can express our C++ types in our config files. For the sake of this talk, now I'm going to be covering several different things. I'm not going to get terribly in depth with things like exposing your C++ types to the scripting engine, because that would take more time than we have. But uh, I'll show you the specific example that I'm going to in a minute here. So another option, or another thing, is application logic. And this is very common for game developers. Um, they want to be able to 
script the logic of their AI or something so they don't have to make a full rebuild every time they want to tweak their AI. They just want to be able to tweak the system at runtime or with a quick file change and relaunch their game. Another thing is user extensibility. Um, GitHub's Atom Editor, for example, they've got, it's written in JavaScript, it's normal to expect that a tool written in JavaScript lets people extend it, writing their own JavaScript things. There's no reason we can't strive for the same kind of flexibility and extensibility with our C++ applications. And this is one of the tools that actually started with ChaiScript. As um, the co-creator of ChaiScript was working on a real-time audio processing system. And he used ChaiScript himself so that it was, a, it was an embedded device. He could telnet into the device and at runtime tweak the variables of the audio processor using the scripting engine's parser to do that for him and get this kind of flexibility that wouldn't really be possible otherwise without writing a bunch of boilerplate code on his own. Does anyone else, uh, people, yes, go ahead. I worked on a project where the UI was all done in a soft language, Python in case. Okay. And, um, but, you know, the high performance stuff was done in a C++ backend. Right. But the UI didn't have to run, at, you know, in a mission critical cycle count. Right, so uh, the comment was, um, a uh, tool that has the GUI written in Python, all the back end written in better performing C++. And yes, that's common. And we're seeing that more and more on the podcast. We've had several guests talking about um, writing the GUI in JavaScript because you can take advantage of all these awesome JavaScript widgets, toolkits that are available and having the back end in C++. <clears throat> yes? Uh, for interactive applications, you might want uh, to allow arbitrary user expressions and writing your own scripting engine for that is overkill. Right, you might want to allow arbitrary user expressions and writing your own scripting engine for that would be overkill. So uh, we've got two main categories of languages that I want to mention. These are languages that were designed specifically and for embedding. Lua, ChaiScript, uh, V8, some um, that's the JavaScript engine from Google, Qt script, AngelScript, others that I'm sure I don't know exist. And then we have languages that can be embedded. Ruby and Python are the two main ones that come to mind. And these have very distinct differences between those that are designed and those that can be. And I'll get to that through the course of the talk. So we're going to cover SWIG, which is the simplified wrapper and interface generator. Boost Python, that's uh, Python bindings layer provided by Boost, self-explanatory. Uh, Sol2, which is a modern C++ binding library for Lua. It's really cool. I'm pretty excited about it. And TriScript. So starting with SWIG. Swig parses your C++ and generates binding layers for various languages. And by various, I mean a whole lot. And I'll show that list. Its last release was just um, before the new year. They are uh, definitely actively in development. And has a wide range of compiler support. The question of you know these uh, fancy C++11 and C++14 bindings like ChaiScript and, and Sol2 and uh, PyBind11, you have to ask yourself, well, what compilers does it actually work with? Swig really, uh, it can output really very basic C++11 stuff. It works with pretty much any compiler that's been released in the last, I would assume, at least three or four years, probably much longer than that. These are all the languages that Swig can bind to. Um, probably just about every language you've heard of and some that you haven't, I'm guessing. Uh, yeah. So Swig, it's mostly automated. You don't have to specify your own interface, but you can choose to. And the generator can automatically create directors. And as far as I know, Swig is the only tool that can do this automatically. So you can define a base class in C++ that has virtual methods. And then with Swig, 
it can create an interface layer for you so that then in Python or Ruby or whatever, you can actually derive from your C++ type and implement the virtual functions. And it can be configured to marshal exceptions in and out of C++. Um, disadvantages are we've got a multiple build steps because it is a code generator. And it adds its own layer of indirection to handle overloads because I don't know if you looked at that list of languages, but most of them don't natively handle overloads. But with Swig, you actually can do overloading. It does a runtime dispatch based on the types. And if you actually want to use this marshalling of exceptions, that's possible. It adds a wrapper around every single function call that has its handling of exceptions in it. And sometimes it can be very sensitive to type definition ordering. So with SWIG, you specify your C++ interface, you execute SWIG, which generates the wrapper file, you compile the wrapper file, initialize your embedded scripting engine, and load your SWIG generated module, and execute your script. All right, so now we get to specifics and code examples. Please slow me down or stop me if any of these don't make sense. This is a header file with a single function that takes hello, or that's called hello, takes a string, returns a string, and this is our implementation in our C++ file that returns hello plus what was ever passed in. Straightforward, right? So this is our SWIG interface file. We are telling SWIG with this percent include directive that we want, to, we want it to include and parse our header file directly. So this is where the automatic parsing and code generation can come in and you can, uh, if you structure your program correctly, you can have SWIG uh, suck in your entire project, which is basically what we're doing with that large project I mentioned at the beginning. And then in these percent uh, braces, in here, we're saying we want this line of code, pound include, exposed code.hpp, to be literally included in the generated SWIG file. Now this is our C++ code, and I'm specifically demoing how to use Ruby in an embedded context with Swig from C++. So at the top, we have to um, declare extern C this function that we know Swig is going to generate for us called init embedded scripting. And I don't generally do that, but I copied it. Well, um, and then in our main, we have to initialize the Ruby system, initialize the Ruby stack stuff. This is like voodoo. The only way to come to the conclusion for what you need to do to embed Ruby in your script, in your C++, is to read the source code for the IRB tool that Ruby provides. There's no documentation for this, but it does work. And then we are, so after we've initialized Ruby, we are then manually initializing the code that we know that Swig is generating for us, and then here's the magic. This, by the way, I would like to declare that we should, as a standard, if we are embedding languages in our C++, use raw string lang uh, literals, saying what language it is. Then we can let our IDE automatically syntax highlight this for us, and I've actually set up them for myself so if I put ChiScript here, then it does syntax highlighting of ChiScript. But I haven't gotten any traction on the standard yet. <laughs> it's sort of free to push it also. <sighs> this is our CMake example, where we are creating a custom command that is calling Swig, telling it we want Ruby output, and we are parsing C++ because Swig actually can wrap C code also. And this is the output file we want it to generate, embedded scripting Ruby underscore wrap, and these are our dependencies. And then when we go to compile, we compile in our main exposed code examples that I just showed you, and the generated CXX file, link everything together with Ruby library. So this is pieces of what Swig is generating for us. We have our wrap hello, which is straightforward. It is the function that is wrapping our hello function. And it is um, 
doing all these things to make sure that the correct number of arguments were passed in because it has to check uh, arity and types itself. So it checks the arity and then it checks to see that it could actually get a string out from what was passed in, handles exceptions if it needs to, and stores the result back in as a Ruby type and returns out. This example is without enabling any of the exception handling, uh, C++ exception handling features that are possible with Swig because it would have added an extra layer of wrapping around all of this. And this is that init embedded scripting that I had to declare for myself at the top of the main. And uh, all it's basically doing is saying it's creating a new module called embedding scripting and it is, um, rah, where am I looking? Oh, right here. It's the function wrap hello that is called hello in the module. All right. Plus an additional 2,000 lines of boilerplate code that it generated for us. And if something goes wrong in here, it can be very difficult to debug what happened. However, can do amazing things. That's boilerplate code automatically handles dependencies. If you have a Ruby module that relies on a different Ruby module that was also created by Swig, can do things like automatically importing it. It's cool. Can do a lot. <sighs> Any questions there? Yes. Is there an easy way to sandbox the languages, particularly like say in Python, so you can't import OS or the question was, is there an easy way to sandbox the language so you cannot import um, external things? <sighs> Not that I am aware of in the languages that I have embedded, which is Ruby and well, mostly Ruby. Uh, I mean, from the Swig standpoint, I mean, Ruby is the bulk of my experience of embedding things. Um, but I don't know. Yes? Is it fast safe? Thread type? Yeah. Oh, we'll get to that. <laughs> yes? You mentioned that you were working with a pretty large scale project. What kind of uh, compile times are you seeing on the Swig class? Um, like what, what kind of compile times are we seeing on the Swig generated files on our large project? Um, minutes might be an understatement. Yeah, this is a concern I've, I've had in the past with Swig. Yes, so he said this is a concern he's had in the past with Swig. Um, we've had we, we've had to do things like, um, in some cases, make sure that not all of the generated Swig files actually try to compile at the same time, because then you run out of memory on your multi-core system. <laughs> it, it, it's yes, and particularly. Um, Okay, uh, so I, I don't have any examples for that for this particular project. I mean, I can't show you any code. I just don't have it available. But one of our libraries is large enough with enough classes in it that we actually, actually two of our libraries are large enough that we had to subdivide those libraries into three to six pieces each just to make sure that each individual Swig generated thing was compilable with the amount of memory available. Yes. It can get out of hand, particularly if you're doing things like directors and you're uh, doing exception handling. Yes? What's the object size? <sighs> size? It strips, it doesn't, I mean, not strip down to the, 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 the generated like .o file is huge. I don't, I don't, I don't have numbers off the top of my head. Um, but it all compiles down pretty nice and tidy actually uh, by the time it's linked into the final executable. And one of the things that we're doing um, on that particular project that's huge is stripping it down to just the core things that we actually need and making a single executable that has everything embedded in it. And apparently that single executable is, is quite manageable, just a few megs considering the extreme amount of stuff that we're exposing. Yeah. That's, so once you get it compiled, it's all right. <laughs> uh, the, the main problem with size that we have had is on Mac OS trying to do 32-bit and 64-bit builds. And then uh, because of the nature of Mac OS, you um, have to kind of ship all of the libraries multiple times because we want our Ruby bindings to both, both be callable 
from our executable, and we want the Ruby bindings to be callable from Ruby itself. And there's no real good way to like install shared libraries in Mac OS. So now then our, then our install explodes, 32-bit, 64 multiple installs of all these things. Yes? Uh, this might be a dumb question, but is, is the Ruby interpreter embedded in your executable? Uh, yeah, uh, mostly, where's my, ooh. Uh, well, oh, I'm missing my include on the top of this example, sorry. Um, yeah, so this eval string, uh, sorry, I didn't describe this here. This is a function that's just defined up here. It's just a handy C++ wrapper for this kind of thing. But yes, we're, um, you know, we can dynamically link or statically link to the, to the Ruby uh, library. But it's um, difficult to get static linking working correctly on multiple platforms. Um, so it's generally I would recommend doing dynamic linking of the Ruby. And I also, <laughs> since the point was uh, embedding a scripting language, I didn't, didn't go too far off into this, but I uh, guess I will for a minute. Um, Ruby, Ruby's uh, header files are really, really bad. <laughs> they, they do things like pound defined their own versions of printf. And really, I mean like throw. They have like a pound defined of throw. I mean, it's, it's bad, bad. So if you want to include it in a C++, um, in a C++ application, you actually have to uh, isolate yourself from, from those things. It's, uh, but it, it is, uh, excuse me, um, I need to clarify all that. It only does that on Windows. <laughs> Th this, is, this is why I like giving talks on cross-platform development and why we need to be friendly to all platforms. It works fine on Linux and Mac. There's no problem. On Windows, they've got like, oh, if you're in Win32, then break the computer. It's, <laughs> yes? Have you tried embedding MRuby instead of uh, Ruby needs to speak? No, uh, and, and by embedding which, I'm sorry? I have not. Actually, I wasn't even familiar with that. It's a relatively new project, and it's uh, designed for embedded, embedding in, in C or C++. OK, so the question is, have I um, used uh, embedded uh, in a specific strain of Ruby that's designed for embedding in C++, or C or C++? And the answer is, no, I have not. I actually was honestly not aware that it existed. Most of the use cases that I've had to do with my clients is we need to be Ruby to Ruby so that you, we can call it either way from our application or from the system. All right. So, Boost Python provides a wrapper layer between Boost and Python. Um, now, I could be wrong. I know there are Boost people here. If anyone can correct me, as far as I can tell, the last significant update to it was in 2009. Anyone? All right. Um, it supports all the compilers that Boost supports, which is cool. And yes? There was a more recent update. OK, there was a more recent update. Yes. OK. 2012 or 2013. 2012 or 2013. All right. Um, I, I went back and I looked through the release history for Boost, and I, or for, yeah, for Boost, and I'm like, Python, 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 and that's uh, what I found. Um, so, uh, if anyone's been following along in the Twitter or Reddit world, a lot of people have been talking about PyBind11. And why didn't I use that? It's because I learned about it too late. And um, as far as I can tell, it doesn't actually have any support for embedding inside your C++ application, and that was the point of my talk. It has a simple build process, an easy to use uh, C++ interface. Um, and you must specify each thing you want bound to Python. There is no generator, which is also an advantage depending on how you're looking at it. And, well, I, if the last update was in 2013, I still argue it's not actively maintained. So you uh, bind your C++ functions to your Python functions, uh, initialize your embedded scripting engine, load internally created module, and execute script. So in one ways, it's very similar, similar to what we had to do with the Ruby swig for the initialization. So we've got, again, our hello function that returns hello plus the input. And we've got 
this thing. We're defining a boost Python module called CPP mod. I copied the boilerplate from the examples. And boost Python def, we want to define a, a function called hello from this function pointer hello. <clears throat> and now, basically our entire example fits on one slide, which is nice. So we are telling Python we want to import um, uh, this module that we just created. And we need to initialize the Python uh, subsystem and do boilerplate kind of things to make sure the modules are loaded. And then we can execute our Python and uh, catch errors if they occur. So I would like to point to this line of code at the bottom, pi error underscore print. That disturbs me. Does anyone want to guess why? It gets no parameter. It gets no parameter, yes, which means <laughs> there's global state. That is my point about the difference between systems that were designed for embedding versus systems that can be embedded. So now our compilation is this single line, nice and handy, um, much simpler than, uh, than SWIG. So we compile uh, the Boost Python example, include our Boost Python, or excuse me, include our Python Headers, I guess I didn't have to manually include uh, boost Python's um, include directory, anyhow. And then link in Python and boost Python. Oh, that was fast. Any questions on that one? All right. Sol2 is our Lua binding tool. Those look awfully familiar, similar. Um, this provides a wrapping layer for us between Lua and C++. Uh, it is actively under development. And these now, so now we're starting to get into the question of what compilers do these things support. So it does support Visual Studio 2015. Um, I'm a huge cross-platform guy, so I hardly would even mention a tool if it doesn't support Visual Studio to some extent. Um, Clang 3.5 and G++ 4.9. Simple build process, easy to use interface, natural interaction with C++, and you must specify each thing you want bound, just like in Python. So we create our Lua state object, we register our C++ objects, and we execute the script. This now is what I'm talking about. So this is, a com this is the complete example now, all literally on one slide. So we've got we're including our sole header. Um, we are, again, exposing the same function. And by the way, I had all these printing from one to a million uh, iterations because I also did a performance comparison for all of the possible tools. And I'll tell you what the result was if you ask. <laughs> <laughs> what is the result? <laughs> well, let's get through the slides, and then we can talk about that. So, uh, yeah, so we no longer have global state. Yay. Um, we include our function from this hello function pointer, call it hello, we execute our script. Ta-da. Very clean. I, I, I am, I'm super impressed. Um, now we're we're going to talk about ChiScript in, uh, in a minute here. Um, but one of the reasons that I created ChiScript was because nothing this clean existed before that. So this, um, I'm, I'm, I'm totally cool with what these guys have done. And single line compile step, just have to link in Lua, include Lua's headers, and specify C++11. Comments on Lua? All right. ChiScript? It's, you know, unnecessary uh, slide there. All right, so it's an embedded scripting engine to co-designed by me, um, specifically for C++. We support um, Visual Studio 2013, Clang 3.4, C++ 4.5. If you really want to, you can go back to Visual Studio 2011 when I was pre-C++ 11 and use the Boost version of it, but there's been 
like two orders of magnitude performance improvement since then, so I wouldn't recommend it. Um, the, the, but I am currently refactoring it to C++14, which then requires the same thing that Sol2 does. We're up to Clang 3.6, C++4.9, and Visual Studio 2015. Um, I'm actively developing it. Setter only, no external dependencies, designed explicitly for integration with C++, and that means also that all types are explicitly shared between the script and the function. You can seamlessly pass functions in and out or strings or whatever. You can share a double between the scripting engine and C++ or a string. It just does what you would expect it to do. And the disadvantage is that it's header only. So I get a fair number of complaints about compile time. Um, and I expect it to add maybe 30 seconds to your build time, depending on the size of your system. Uh, but to be fair, that is compiling the entire scripting engine and all of its standard library and all of its bindings. So you create a ChiScript engine object, you register your C++ things, and execute the script. And now this is our example here. We are creating a ChiScript object, passing in the standard library that we want it to use. This, uh, this exists so that you can do separate compilation of the standard library and the main part of the scripting engine. Expose our function and evaluate a million times, print hello world. And it's virtually identical compilation to uh, the Lua one to Sol2 um, with the difference that by default I'm multi-threaded so pthread gets linked in if you're multi-threaded on Unix. On, actually, do you have to do that on macOS? I don't think you do. Anyone know? Well, I mean, just in general, if you're compiling multi-threaded code on macOS, do you have to pass dash pthread? Don't think so. You do if you're using G++, right? GCC. Yeah. Oh, GCC, oh, on, on macOS you do. Yeah. I can never, some of these uh, subtle, um, Things hard to keep straight with the different platforms. And I link in LDL. Maybe that's the one that I don't have to link in on Mac OS. That's uh, because it supports dynamically loaded modules by default, so I need LDL. All right. Um, so I don't recommend embedding either Python or Ruby because of that. Um, it's a global state. Global state means multi-threading is somewhere between very difficult and nearly impossible. The other engines, though, Lua and ChiScript, it's irrelevant. Well, Lua, I do not believe, uh, can handle multiple threads accessing the same state object at the same time. But you could have multiple Lua states going. ChiScript, you can do either multiple threads accessing the same ChiScript object or multiple ChiScript objects going at the same time. Um, but there might be institutional reasons why you would want to use Ruby or Python or any of the other languages that aren't specifically designed for embedding. Um, you might have existing code in those languages or existing knowledge base, uh, some sort of, you know, you, you want to work with what your people know. And just because Ruby isn't recommended doesn't mean Swig is not, because remember, Swig supports a vast number of languages. So you can use Swig with Lua also, Swig with V8. OK, so did we have any questions? Yes? Tell us about the oh, you want to hear about the performance. Um, it turned out that uh, Sol2 was the fastest. It was able to execute approximately, so if we remember the example, here of calling this function a million times. What, what its throughput ended up being was something on my platform of something like four million callbacks per second. And then uh, Python and Ruby were tied at approximately two million callbacks per second. And ChiScript came in at about one million callbacks per second. And I have since, um, that my current development branch is closer to like 1.25 million callbacks per second. So I'm working on it. And 
by the way, I have CB, uh, CBB cast stickers. If anyone wants any stickers, come and get swag from me after this. But any other questions? Yes. Uh, but so you said it seems that the TriScript is lower. Is it because the alarm mode go thread to access the same single object? Uh, the question is, why is TriScript slower? Part of it is uh, it is thread safe by default, but I actually did disable thread safety for these comparisons, so I was doing more of an apples to apples. You can disable thread safety, and that gets you like at currently like three and a half percent performance improvement. Every with every change I make, I'm 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 narrowing this window of how much multi-threaded cost us. Um, the other thing is I. Uh, fully respect um, all of the uh, types and constness of my parameters, which I don't believe, I know, I know Swig does, um, and I assume Boost Python does. I don't know if Sol2 does. PyBind11, I know explicitly states it does not respect the constness of parameters. It casts them away. Um, uh, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not as mature as Lua, for sure. Um, that's one reason why I'm slower. I'm, you know, I'm just working on it. Uh, and um, I, it's kind of crazy, but ChiScript will let you do things like add overloads after a function has been declared. So um, I cannot, at the time of parsing a script, there's no way for me to determine which overload will be called because I don't know if the user is going to choose to later add an overload that is more appropriate. <laughs> you don't like that. <laughs> it makes a tricky problem. Yes, I am currently experimenting with an optimizer that would let you say, I know that all of the overloads that are currently available are those that will exist and therefore make my script run faster. And I'm actually currently refactoring it so that the optimizer itself can be pluggable and other people can help me play with these things. Yes? Uh, one thing I've struggled with with the uh, PyGraph, which I believe is a Python graph version of this graph. OK. Is that because the, the C++ code is so generic, basically the person who wrapped it had to choose some, some particular instantiations, right? Like, yes. Like of all the possible things that you can compile, they picked like one or two. And I also discovered, because I wasn't thinking about it, that I couldn't like uh, override, you know, I couldn't inherit from it and override some of the things because it was already compiled in. And I was wondering if, in, in the process of using scripting languages and, and binding C++ stuff, you had come up with any solutions or, or strategies for this kind of thing. Okay, so the question was, uh, or the comment slash question, <clears throat> is that our um, heavily templatized code is a pain to wrap because you have to choose which instantiations of the templates you want to expose to your scripting engine. Is that a fair summary? That is simply a problem. I mean, it's, it's, it's true for the reasons you stated. You have to have a compiled version of the template to be able to wrap it. Um, Swig, uh, you can define that things are templates in Swig and then say, I want these instantiations of the templates, and that's pretty cool. Um, with with ChiScript or Sol2 or any of these other ones, you could do that for yourself. You could define an instantiator, if you will, and then pass in the instantiations you want. But it is, as far as I know, a gen as, at the, the high level, it's a problem that without a solution. Because even um, uh, someone that I've, I interact with on Twitter, uh, uh, Manu Sanchez, is working on a on reflection engine for C++. And there's there's no there's still no great answer for it. Um, yeah, I'm trying to convince him to make a binding generator for ChiScript. I think I might have him convinced. Yes. Well, there are crazy approaches that from Python you trigger a C++ build that then inserts template parameters. So as far as I know, the oh. physics, finite elements don't use a fix like that. So, there are some code bases around which then dynamically call the compiler, load the code, and jump into it. So, so the comment was, <laughs> the comment was you can, with certain tricks, have your scripting engine uh, dynamically compile your C++ with the template parameters that you wanted to have. Yes. Uh, yes. Is 
So uh, SWIG and SOL2, do they have performance overhead? SWIG does um, because it has to do at uh, runtime uh, comparison of which overload you want to call. Uh, if you have no overloads, then it's faster. It, takes, it doesn't generate the, um, the overload resolution code. Um, SOL2 <laughs> takes a uh, tact that probably I should have when creating ChiScript and that you have to define all of your overloads at once when you pass it to the function binding code, and then it can do something smart with all those overloads, and it, it has very fast overload resolution, very fast callbacks. I actually, um, I tried to slow it down and failed uh, um, in my playing around with that. It, it's good. Yes? Uh, other than like, I guess the multi-threading thing, or maybe including that, what, what sort of use cases would ChiScript um, excel at over the other? If you want to, uh, the question is, what cases would ChiScript excel over the other options? If you want, uh, I, I, didn't, I didn't actually come here trying to specifically advertise for ChiScript, <laughs> but, um, so I don't have any of those slides here, but you can, um, you can do things like create a function in ChiScript and then pull it back out of ChiScript as a stood function and just use it from your C++ seamlessly. You can similarly pass a std function into ChiScript and use it as a ChiScript function seamlessly. Um, uh, you can throw exceptions in ChiScript and catch them in your C++ or throw exceptions in the C++ that you're calling from ChiScript and catch it in ChiScript with a chi catch block. Um, the sent, what's that? Did you say a chi catch? Try, try, try catch. <laughs> uh, the, the, um, let's see. Yeah, uh, it, it's, oh, uh, the syntax is specifically designed to feel familiar to C++ users. So if you want a scripting engine that is built for C++, then I recommend ChiScript. If you want the absolute fastest and simple to use thing that you can think of, then I would recommend Sol2. If you want, um, if you want to use you, uh, institutional knowledge that you already have in your organization, then use SWIG and wrap whatever language you want to wrap. Or boost Python or PyBind11 or one of these other uh, things that have been coming out lately. Anything else? Cool, thank you. And remember, come get stickers.